1891, the heart of the Gilded Age. Despite the unprecedented economic growth and rampant innovation that followed the reconstruction efforts after the American Civil War, it was still a tumultuous time in America. While the world's first skyscrapers were being erected in Chicago, Illinois, Wabash, Indiana had already introduced the first electric street lights in the United States. Thomas Edison had just patented the motion picture camera and the first commercial automobile sales were less than five years away. Meanwhile, the remnants of the Old West were quickly being washed away. Legends like Wild Bill Hickok, Billy the Kid, Doc Holliday, and even Jesse James were already nothing more than memories when the atrocities at Wounded Knee occurred in December of 1890. The era of the cowboy and dreams of conquering the wild frontier were quickly coming to an end. And a new world, a modern world, a world of electricity, steam, and scientific wonder were beginning to emerge. And with this new world came new horrors. Monsters shambling out of dark forbidden forests or clawing their way out of rocky crevices were soon replaced by fears of unimaginable otherworldly terrors lurking, unseen, in the endless unknown of the night skies above. History is rife with tales of the inexplicable and of the unknown. Stories so bizarre, they send the fingers of doubt creeping into the recesses of our very minds. Join us as we investigate. This week in Creepy History... Welcome to Season 1, Episode 4 of the Creepy Acres Podcast, This Week in Creepy History. I'm Laura Cram, and with me as always is my Bigfoot co-host, Sam Squatch. Hey, Sam. Hey, how you doing, Laura? How's your summer going? Summer is almost over. Well, I mean, oh God, it is. Oh my God. (laughs) It's been hot as shit. It has, and it's going to get like 100 degrees again next week here. Oh my God. Summer's like almost over, but it's like, fuck you, I'm not letting go. It's like the husband in, uh, what was that movie? Sleeping with the Enemy? Yeah. Jesus Christ. You're never getting rid of me, Julia Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, she, uh, <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. She fucking shot that guy. So, yeah. Sam, how, like, how do you stay cool in this warm weather with all that fur? Well, I mean, obviously, I'm cool as shit. So, I mean, right out of the gate, that helps. But it used to be, it's called texturizing. It used to be called thinning. <laughs> so, I got a lot of that done. It's crazy. Okay. And it helps. Yeah, I'm sure you're expecting something, some smart ass remark, but I'm here to give life tips, goddammit. <laughs> I was. Is that our new podcast, Life Tips with Sam? I mean, I suppose. Life hacks. Life hacks. Life hacks with Sam. I mean, you'd probably only get about like three episodes in. I mean, before I'd be like, I've ran out of shit. <laughs> I don't know. I've got nothing. <laughs> Just the three good ones. Yeah, there's only there's only three things you need to know about. Texturize your hair, so thin it out, you know. Uh-huh. Um, you know, wipe properly. I mean, that's a big one. You got to wipe properly. Jesus Christ. I mean, people don't want to talk about it. When you're covered with this much hair, wiping properly is very important. Uh-huh. Okay. And what's number three? I don't remember right now. But it's very important, goddamn. It's very important. Okay. Okay. I believe you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, got talking about- Don't talk over people. What that's what it is. <laughs> don't talk over people. That's number three. Guess what we're talking about on this episode. I have no clue. I have no clue. What are we talking about? Well, it happened in Indiana. Is it the Beast of Busco? It's not. It's not Oscar. No! I love that guy. Me too. We went there this summer on our little road trip. We did. Stop by Trebusco, Indiana. The first road trip together? Yeah. In ABBA? Yeah. 
eating snacks. It was nice. It was nice. Aww. Yeah. I mean, Aww. you did eat you did eat all my churros, but I'll forgive you because they are goddamn good. They were so good. Well, you ate all my beef jerky and ate my blue raspberry slushy, so that's what you get. That's true. Take that. But to be fair, you hand it to me, so it's kind of on you for trusting me. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of your fault. Okay. Fine. All right. I think we just had our first fight on air. <laughs> Oh my god. Anyway. So, okay. So, is it Oscar? No, it's not. Ah, son of a bitch. God damn. All right. So, what is it? Have you heard of the Crawfordsville monster? Well, if you're talking about wrestling legend, the ultimate warrior, yes, yes, I have heard of him. Now, he said, I hail from parts unknown. But we all know, all the fans knew, he was from Crawfordsville, Indiana, wrestled the heavyweight title from Hulk Hogan during WrestleMania 4, and I want to also add, my grandma did credit him as giving her more lady boners than any other wrestler in the history of wrestling. Lady boners. I only know that because every Thanksgiving, my mom would say, hey, let's go around the table and say what we're grateful for. And, and grandma would shoot her hand up and she'd be like, oh, I know what I'm thankful for. And we'd all be like, God damn it, grandma. We know. We don't want to hear it again. Jesus Christ. I need to Google this guy. It's like if a member of a glam band mm -hmm. turned into the Incredible Hulk or... Like if you took like a thing of steroids and self-tanning lotion and baby oil, just shove that shit together and made a person. <laughs> it's crazy. This is awesome. I am very excited. That's not what we're talking about. God damn. Why do you keep leading me on? Jesus Christ. I wanted to hear about the lady boner. All right. What are we talking about? What the hell are we talking about? We're talking about the Crawfordsville monster. Ooh. But that's all I'm going to tell you because you know who knows more about this? Nathaniel Leonard's. Crawfordsville, Indiana. Founded in March of 1823 along the banks of the Sugar Creek. Surrounded by deciduous forests and arable land, this seemingly small town would quickly become a major hub of trade and transportation not just for Indiana's Montgomery County, but for the entire Midwest. In fact, by 1832, not even a decade later, a liberal arts school for men Wabash College would be established, and soon Crawfordsville would find itself heralded as a center for education as well as the arts, eventually even proclaiming themselves to be the Athens of Indiana. Over the years that followed, the town would be home to numerous great minds and famed writers alike, including Civil War General Lew Wallace, who, while living in Crawfordsville, would begin writing his epic novel, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. The very same novel that would later be adapted into the now classic 1959 film starring Charlton Heston. However, in the latter part of the 19th century, Crawfordsville, Indiana, would find itself the subject of another story, not one steeped in themes of vengeance, Christian redemption, and spiritual forgiveness, but instead, a true life account of humanity's helplessness in the face of bizarre, unearthly unknowns. September 5th, 1891. It is 2 a.m. on a cool Saturday morning, and Henry Marshall McIntyre, 33, and Bill Gray, 26, two ice delivery men, are at the stables of their employer, William Martin, in an alley just off East Main Street. McIntyre is hitching up a team of horses to a wagon in preparation for the men's nightly journey to retrieve a load of ice from the ice house that sits just north of Crawfordsville, along the Sugar Creek. Gray, meanwhile, is still busy working away inside the stables. As McIntyre's hands go about the business of placing on the horses bridles and yokes, he is suddenly and inexplicably struck by an overwhelming feeling of utter awe and dread. 
as a wave of terror washes over him, the man stops and slowly turns. He looks about in his unease, but sees nothing. However, he knows something is there. It's just out of sight, clawing at the back of his mind. Something is beckoning to him. McIntyre's eyes turn upward toward the endless void of the night above. And there, he witnesses something so bizarre that it nearly defies description. There, some 300 feet above, against the endless velvety void of a nearly moonless night, writhes and convulses a massive, nameless horror. Other than one great red flaming eye, it is utterly faceless, and strange fins seem to run down both its sides. And yet, the shape of its white, bulky body is utterly undefined. The bizarre, ethereal entity, like a massive undulating shroud, swoops and swims through the air in a dance that is both graceful and yet terrifying. The Weekly Herald, a newspaper out of Huntington, Indiana, would run the following description in its issue dated September 11th, 1891. It was about 300 or 400 feet in the air, and most gruesome in aspect. It was 18 feet long and 8 feet wide, and moved rapidly through the air by means of several pairs of side fins. It was pure white and had no definite shape or form, resembling somewhat a great white shroud fitted out with propelling fins, with no tail or head visible, but there was one great flaming eye. There was a sort of a, a wheezing, plaintive sound was emitted from a mouth, which was invisible. It flapped like a flag in the wind as it came on, and frequently gave a great squirm, as though suffering some unutterable agony. Just then, Gray returns from the stables to find his partner McIntyre staring dumbfounded up at the night sky at a bizarre and ghastly apparition. Both men, now enthralled, watch in helpless wonder as the otherworldly thing moves east until it reaches the edge of Crawfordsville. There, it turns and circles back toward the Martin property. Gray briefly considers going to the main house waking the Martin family to alert them to the mysterious thing currently circling their home, but ultimately decides to simply let them sleep. As the two ice delivery men stand in the alleyway outside their employer's stable, watching the ominous entity, another feeling washes over them. They begin to feel exposed as the creeping unease of uncertainty takes them. They have no idea what they are looking at or what it might be capable of. So, with that, McIntyre and Gray retreat to the safety of the stable, believing its walls and roof will deliver some protection. And from there, they continue to watch the bizarre spectacle for the next hour. Just after 3 a.m., a very stark reality begins to set in for McIntyre and Gray. Ice delivery men don't get paid if they don't deliver ice. So, despite their terror and trepidation, the two men venture out from under the protection of the Martin stable, crawl aboard their delivery wagon, and begin a short trek north to the ice house, constantly glancing back watch the bizarre creature circling their employer's property. Once at the ice house, their fear begins to subside as they are far enough away they can no longer see the hideous monstrosity. Then, McIntyre and Gray begin the arduous task of loading ice onto the wagon. And by the time they finish and begin to head back, the sun has already risen and the creature is nowhere to be seen. Both men 
America so disturbed by the encounter that they begin carrying a rifle on their route, vowing to shoot the beast should it ever return. While this may be the end of McIntyre and Gray's account, it isn't the end of the tale. For the very next night, the next chapter in the saga began, when just around midnight, the creature returned. It is a still, windless night, and the moon is almost non-existent when Reverend George Washington Switzer, 37, steps out of the door to his home to get a drink of water from the backyard well. As Switzer attempts to quench his thirst, he too, much like McIntyre the night before, is hit by a sudden wave of dread and fear, like an animal suddenly feeling the eyes of a predatory beast focusing on it from the camouflage of the jungle. The Reverend then finds his attention drawn up toward the heavens, and there, rapidly moving toward him against the starlit night, as if swimming in the sky is an undulating, writhing mass, twisting like a serpent. Switzer would describe it as 16 feet long, 8 feet wide, but looking like a mass of drapery moving through the air. He would add, It looked much like a fleecy, milk-white cloud, or like a demon in a shroud. Bewildered, the man calls for his wife, Lita, who soon joins him outside. Together, the couple observe the sight, knowing that what they are seeing isn't some sort of cloud or vessel, balloon, or even fabric caught in the wind, but rather it is some sort of entity. It is something alive. Then it begins to descend until the couple loses sight of it behind a neighboring home. The Switzers quickly run out to the street where they once again catch sight of the bizarre beast as it rises back into the sky. Soon, like the night before, it begins circling Crawfordsville and, like the night before, Switzers, like McIntyre and Gray, begin to grow uneasy. Soon, they retreat back into the safety of their home and shelter there for the remainder of the night. The story is covered in the local newspaper, but soon it spreads as it's picked up by the various newspapers around the state and then the country. Within days, it becomes national news, and soon, the postmaster of Crawfordsville, Indiana, finds his office flooded with mail from the curious as well as letters from those simply wanting to report their own sightings. As the years passed, the story died down and would have all but been forgotten, except years later, Charles Fort, a legendary writer of anomalous phenomenon, would rediscover the story while scouring newspaper archives for his research. It was there he would find the September 10, 1891 issue of the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper and resurrect the story of the Crawfordsville monster. Instantly, Fort would find himself questioning the validity of the story. The suspicious Fort was convinced there had never been a Reverend G.W. Switzer of Crawfordville, Indiana. Doubting the man's very existence, Fort begins to investigate and is shocked to learn that, indeed, Reverend George Washington Switzer, now located in Michigan, had, in September of 1891, called Crawfordsville, Indiana, home. And there he had served the Crawfordsville First Methodist Church from 1887 to 1892. Fort immediately writes to the Reverend and is hopeful when he eventually receives a letter back. However, the Reverend's correspondence is simply to inform Fort that he is currently traveling in California, but promises a full account of the sighting once he returns from his travels. Unfortunately, 
Fort never hears from the Reverend again. So, just what was the Crawfordsville monster? Speculations on its identity are varied. Some believe the evil apparition was a sign of the end times, a literal harbinger of the apocalypse, while others thought it was a ghost or demon. Others had more mundane, albeit bizarre, explanations, such as it being groups of boys or sending cats outfitted with parachutes up into the air with balloons. In the end, one theory was used to dismiss the entire event. Two men, John Hornbeck, 41, and Abe Hernley, 48, claimed that they too had seen the strange visitor and in the early morning hours had bravely followed the bizarre beast out of town and declared it was nothing more than a flock of birds. Killdeer, to be exact, performing what are known as murmurations. This is when birds fly closely packed in intricate undulating patterns that to some may look like fabric in the wind. Speculation would further include theories that the birds, while flying through the night in their yearly migration south, had become disoriented by Crawfordville's newly installed electric streetlights. This caused them to circle the city. As they did, the light illuminated the white underbellies of countless tiny birds, giving the appearance of a moving, undulating shroud. So, was it simply birds misidentified under the gloom of night, or was it something else? Despite the fact that killdeer were quite common in the Crawfordsville area, so citizens wouldn't have been very likely to misidentify them, or the fact that the birds wouldn't explain the creature's single fiery eye. The explanation did quiet the citizens' fears. However, there is one final detail that possibly complicates the bird explanation even further. Decades after the event, Vincent Gaddis, a writer and reporter who worked as a journalist in Crawfordsville during the 1930s, would years after Charles Fort's death pick up where the man had left off by interviewing the numerous older residents of Crawfordsville, Indiana, who claimed to have been witnesses to the second night's events. While newspapers at the time had focused solely on the Reverend Switzer sighting and that of the ice delivery men, they had failed to mention or purposefully admitted the hundreds of reports from Crawfordsville citizens that claimed to have seen the creature as it circled their town. In fact, after hearing about McIntyre and Gray's sightings, the very next night, numerous townspeople gathered in the streets, waiting, hoping to catch a glimpse of the mysterious atmospheric beast. And they had gotten their wish. In fact, not only did the beastly nightmare make an appearance, but repeatedly swooped so low that townspeople could feel its hot breath. And with that, we are left with one final thought. Is it possible that there exists great unknown beasts out there among the stars that travel through the vastness of space as if it were nothing more than another great ocean? Like massive interstellar whales, they migrate through the cosmos, sharing their melancholic song. was that i like that that's weird i i uh i'm not gonna lie this one this one is icky i don't like this one i there's i don't know what in the heck was that i i don't know your guess is as good as mine my god my god birds it's birds what birds 
nerds. Come on. Okay, look, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this. What do you think it is? Look, I mean, I don't know. The way I look at it, there's three clear options here. One, it's birds, okay? Birds. It's just a flock of birds. Now, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know about you, but I mean, these people, okay? These people that live in this town. Yeah, it's 1891, but they've seen goddamn birds. I know they don't have the internet. It's birds. But, but they've seen birds, okay? So, I, I'm not necessarily buying the bird explanation right again, all right? Uh -huh. so that's number one. Number two, the balloon thing. This the weird balloon cat thing. That's weird. Now, if they had said it was like a hot air balloon. A white hot air balloon? Okay. And like that it had gotten popped, you know? And like it was like a cartoon. Like, <laughs> you know, it's going around, you know, <laughs> flying around town like a cartoon or something. Like a, and, the, and the fiery mm -hmm. eye was actually the fire that they used to, you know, get the hot air balloon up and the big flappy body was actually, was in fact the balloon, okay? And that, um... It's making like a wheezing noise. You know, the, the, the wheezing sound was the air escaping the balloon. Look, if they had said that, it'd be like, maybe, maybe, I might buy that. I see your, I can see it. I can picture it. And I'll tell you right now, the third option, I do not like. Mm -hmm. The third option, I do not like at all. The third option is, this is some sort of atmospheric beast right. that just drops out of the goddamn sky and is capable of just snatching people up and that creeps me right the fuck out. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. okay. I'll tell you right now. If that is the case, I, I need to ask. I need to ask. Are there cases of like bones and blood or just chunks of meat just falling out of the sky? You know, as, as this thing just wipes its mouth like if, it, if it's even got one and like this, this shit just falls from the sky. There, are there cases of that happening? Spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah, there are. Oh. There are cases of that happening. Oh my god, it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Or birds. <laughs> do you know who we have on tonight? I do not. If if I had to if I had to guess. I think you know. If I had to throw it a guess, I am going with I think you know deep down who it is. Oh look, it can only be one person. If we're talking about Crawfordsville, Indiana. And that of course is the one person whose greatness was sounds at all, two-time WWE Intercontinental Champion, the 2014 inductee to the Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Ultimate Warrior. Yes, yes. No. Yeah. Oh God. Oh, God no. Damn it. Uh, Sam, he's dead. I'm sorry. He died of a heart attack. Dead? Oh, I don't know about that, sister. We we we've been through this before. Okay. We fans thought the Ultimate Warrior was dead when the Undertaker and Paul Bear lock the ultimate war inside of a casket and and the wwf officials had to come out and bust it open and then they had to do cpr on the guy to revive him you know we thought he was dead then we also thought he was dead when jake the snake roberts tricked him into getting bit in the face by a cobra okay so i'm gonna tell you right now let me tell you right now i'm not I, I, i'm not buying it that's all i'm saying <gasps> he's dead get over it son of a bitch all right, who's the guest? Okay, well, this person is the mastermind behind Bicep Books, and he's written over 45 books, and he has a podcast. It is author John LeMay. <gasps> you know who he is? Oh, my God! John LeMay, yes! Yes, author of Cowboys and Saurians, which he has. Oh, my God, one, two, three, four, four. He's gonna, it's got to be up to, like, eight volumes now. Oh, my God, and, 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 mm -hmm. he also did an entire series of books with uh, Noah Torres, uh, 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 Real Cowboys and Aliens. Yes. <gasps> yes. And he writes about Godzilla and all the lost films. Yes. Oh. <laughs> you know what? You did, you did yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, John has a podcast that he's co-host of, and it's called Plop Pit. Have you listened to it? I have not. I have not. I, I don't know if you know this, but I was in mourning. I just found out very recently the Ultimate Warrior passed away. <laughs> Well, let's talk to John about this. Yes! Yeah! Hopefully that helped your heart a little. Okay, let, okay, let, well, let's, enough waiting. Let's, let's get to it. Put him on. All right, so we have John LeMay. He is the author of numerous books, including Space Monsters of the Old West, Monsters of the Old South, and he has a seven book series called Cowboys and Saurians. He also has another series. This is a three book. And it's Cowboys and Monsters. He and Noe Torres co-author another three-book series, Early 20th Century UFOs, as well as the four-book series, The Real Cowboys and Aliens. And this isn't even including the many books he's written on film, history, and more. So, John, welcome to the show. 
It's great to be on here, and it's this is the first time I've ever heard Sam, and I have to say he kind of reminds me of, of Charlie from Always Sunny. Oh! I knew you were going to bring up Always Sunny somehow. Yeah. And so I feel really comfortable here. I, I feel like this is Charlie as a Sasquatch, so I, I like it. I, I'm, I'm intrigued to get to know him better. You know, it, 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 it's not an unfair comparison, as I also have been known to fight rodents with a bat and uh, eat cat food before I go to bed. So... I mean, I love that show. Anything with Danny DeVito in there, I'm sold automatically. Yeah, it's the best. John LeMay yeah. uh, quotes Always Sunny a lot. It was because he got good taste. I mean, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I've, I've been compared to all three of the dudes. I've been compared to Charlie. I've been compared to Mac. I've been compared to Dennis. I don't know if any of those are compliments or not. But you look like Danny DeVito, so. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, yeah. When he was younger, yeah. Look, you can say whatever you want about Danny DeVito, but I, I will tell you right now, I will guarantee you, all right? It is, it is 100% fact. There are women on this planet right now, tons of them, tons, who would line up gladly for a shot at that tiny, tiny, beautiful little man. <laughs> so how dare you? How dare yeah. you? He is America's sweetheart and treasure. God damn it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, Laura can be a bit a bit <laughs> savage. She, uh, she, is, <laughs> she does not hold back. Yeah. He knows. I'm not explaining for you. I'm explaining for the audience at home who's listening right now going, oh my God, this is how she treats their guests. <laughs> yeah. We're friends. All because of you, Sam. You introduced us. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I, you know what? I guess I never put that together until just a second. But you know what? In this, in this business, in the biz, as they say, you guys would have met eventually. All right. Probably at some point. Oh, yeah. I just, you know, greased the wheels and sped things up, you know, like uh, cash or cocaine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are talking about the Crawfordsville monster. Yeah. Or, or did you all want me to say something? No. Don't say anything. Oh, okay. Oh, thank goodness. Don't say a thing. Let's just sit there and look beautiful. Okay. My God. <laughs> if you people could see him right now. <laughs> Jesus Christ, he's a work of art. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> like Laura said, I look like Danny DeVito. That's, you know. He does not for the folks out there. <laughs> So as a recap, there was two delivery ice guys, right, uh, trying to hitch up their horse yeah. to make the delivery or to go grab some ice. And one of them felt uneasy, right? Looked mm -hmm. up in the sky and just saw this weird, what, what did you even call it? Well, they, they keep describing it as a big white like shroud. So I'm picturing like a big flag, like a big chunk of fabric, like a tapestry flapping around, you know? But like... But with a flaming red eye. Yeah. And then a reverend saw it, right? A couple, like a, the next day. And then supposedly some other town citizens. Yeah. So I I don't remember this stuff. I literally had to read my book again, like 10 minutes before the show. And this is what I, me and Noe wrote. So <laughs> uh, basically that's right. But it's kind of like the opposite. It was the first night uh, this reverend Switzer guy was going out to his well. And he caught sight of the creature that looked like a, they called it like a flying shroud, like in different mm -hmm. pieces with the flaming eye. And they just watched it. And it was huge, right? Like, yeah. what are we talking? Do we remember anyone? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I believe, I, I believe it was described as being 18 feet long, but it was also three, was it? Oh my God. Did they say it was like 300 feet in the air? Th this is the stuff where we get back to that. Like, oh, it's 18 feet, but it's 300 feet away. Yeah. How the hell big, how do you even know it's that big? And it's night. Right. Yeah. And then the only other detail I remember is uh, the word got around. So the next night, the townspeople went out and they watched for it and it returned and a ton of people saw it. But then, you know, the not so fun part of the story is these two guys claim they followed it through, you know, they followed it, I think, on ground by horseback or something and watched it fly away. And they claim that once it got far enough out of town and out of the fog, they acted like it was just a flock of birds. Yeah. Which I don't really believe because number one, that's no fun. And two, you know, it has the flaming red eye and just all the other weird stuff. And you've always got this world full of non-believers who don't want to believe in the fantastic and they will do everything they can to explain it away. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I think it was a real monster. And uh, what's also really cool is Charles Fort investigated it many years later. And Fort actually found uh, Reverend Switzer's address and wrote to him and like actually confirmed that Switzer was a real man. And Switzer wrote back and was like, yes, this really happened. I saw it. It wasn't made up or exaggerated for the papers. It happened. So that's a pretty good sign. 
So, so just out of curiosity, uh, for, for our listeners who might not be familiar with Charles Fort, um, can, can you explain to them uh, the importance of, of, of that person? Yeah, so Fort was born in the 1870s, and when he came of age, uh, you know, I think he just kind of remembered some of the strange newspaper articles he would read growing up, and he decided to start tracking them down and collecting them later in life. And uh, so he, he was just one of the first... You know they didn't have they didn't even have the term UFO back then like ufologist or cryptozoologist so so Fort just made a habit of collecting all the weirdest uh, anomalous articles he could find and you know investigating them best that he could back in those days and uh, you know due to that anything strange sometimes will be called Fort Fortian or Fortian oh, oh so that's so the term Fortian uh, that, that it actually comes from Charles Fort's name that's cool all right yeah. That makes sense. So, um, so he really at that time, like he was this. I mean, there were no experts, but he would have been the closest thing. Yeah, yeah. First person to really take an interest in it and run with it. I, I mean, I'm sure people were interested, but he's the one who did a lot of work. This, this thing, this whatever the hell this is, this this creature. I don't know. I mean, it almost defies description. I mean, am I right? I mean, come on. It, it wouldn't be like a flying saucer or, or or like a spaceship at this time. They probably would have called it a an airship. You know, it's not one of those, and it's not, I, I don't even know if it's a monster. What the heck? Like, like, what's your take on this thing? Me or Laura? Oh, you, absolutely. I don't give a shit what Laura thinks. Okay. No, no I <laughs> uh, So I, I definitely go with the, what Carl Sagan called the atmospheric beast theory. Ooh. That there's these atmospheric life forms that kind of float around up in the skies that nobody's ever caught one before to prove their existence oh. so yeah i don't think it's a ufo or even an alien i think atmospheric beast oh my god now now would that be similar to um jordan peele's nope oh that was good did you see that recently that's exactly yeah that is exactly what nope was and i don't think very many people realize that but yeah nope was about an atmospheric beast not a ufo and i love that movie i'd love to like yeah dig into that movie too but. oh that's very cool now, I mean, what, now being that you're a film buff, you know, obviously, and you love monsters, do you think there's any chance that perhaps Jordan Peele was inspired by this movie to make whatever the hell that, you know, make to make Nope and whatever the hell that creature was? Or or was he just winging it? I think, well, you know, whether he'd ever heard of Crawfordsville or not, I think he had to have heard of atmospheric beasts and just the idea of these strange, almost formless, gelatinous uh, creatures that kind of fly around through the skies and but yeah, I, I honestly thought Nope was pretty scary. Uh, that scene where it finally eats the people and you see them like getting digested. That was mm -hmm. that was one of the scariest things I've seen in a long, long time. So I definitely recommend Nope to anyone who hasn't watched it. Spoiler alert. Oh, but they wouldn't have watched it. And you just gave it away. Uh, the, my theory is if you haven't seen <laughs> Nope yet, you didn't want to see it. But now that I spoiled it, you'll totally want to see it. Yeah, and there's people that are going to now be like, okay, now that I know what it is, now I'll go see. Because before I was uncertain, and I might have been scared. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And to go along with what you were saying, like how your belief in that it was a monster and all the other strange things that went along with this, you know, there, there are the descriptions of how this thing was swooping down over them, and they could feel its hot breath. Yeah. And again, like, that doesn't sound like a flock of birds. And it emitted a noise, too, right? Yeah. A wheezing noise. Yeah. Yeah, and, so, and again, like, okay, maybe you could convince yourself that a bunch of birds could sound like wheezing or something. Maybe. But, like, at this point, I feel like they're just trying to settle the public down and make them feel better, you know? Yeah. And did people think it was, like, a weird cloud, too? Like, just a cloud that was hovering lower? Or am I just making that up? I don't think I've ever seen that explanation. So, yeah, I think you're okay. just making stuff up. <laughs> Now, no, I do believe there was something about when it was like coming towards them. They probably for a moment thought it was a cloud because it's white. It's in the sky, whatever. But I, I'm guessing that, that that idea went right out the goddamn window, you know, once they saw the flaming red eye. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Makes sense. 100%. You know, it's, and it's interesting that they went with that. Oh, well, well, it's a, it's a flock of birds that, it, that at no point was it like, it was a flock of like some sort of insect. Like, cause that, mm -hmm. I mean, that would have been, I mean, especially if there was like, I don't know what the hell the light source would have been, but if you had a light source, it's like a balloon with a something attached to it. They said that, uh, kids were, uh, putting parachutes on cats and putting them in the air with balloons. Oh, all right. okay. So that's horrifying. 
That sounds like something Charlie would do. That that sounds like a sunny episode. Cats with balloons. And... It does. <laughs> it's the only way to get rid of Sky <laughs> Um, But yeah, it was what? Starling or Kildare? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I've already forgotten what I read 10 minutes ago, even, even though I wrote the book. It's just... Uh, Man, LeMay. Well, you know, I've written like over 50 books now, and that takes a toll on the old noggin after a while. You just, yeah, you're so old. There's no more room. There's no more room. Oh my god, I know what you mean. Look, over the summer I decided, hey, you know what? I am I'm gonna binge watch the Japanese anime One Piece. Yeah, yeah. There are one thousand and seventy four episodes of that goddamn thing. And I'll tell you right now, when I got done watching it, I can no longer math. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All that everything I learned, everything gone. It's all gone. Yeah. Because there's always so much room, goddammit. What are we gonna do with you? Now, supposedly <laughs> another explanation that I've heard. Uh, besides the kill deer, uh, uh, some people have put forward that it was also starlings, that, that it could have been starlings, which are also known for those sort of, uh, those undulating sort of flying patterns. But starlings were not native to North America. They had only been introduced the year before, and I believe they were all still up in like Central Park at that time. So that was not an option. And the city had just installed new electric lights, and they're saying that the birds got disoriented, right? Yeah, that was their explanation, that the, the electric lights disoriented the birds, which I don't get. I, I feel like that's an old-timey explanation. An old-timey? Yeah, like, because electricity was still kind of new in some <laughs> parts of the world. Like, oh, it disrupted the birds, like. Uh, whatever i don't know i don't know honestly i could go either way on this because on the one hand i understand there's a fear of new technology yeah and so you want to blame that for everything you know it's mm -hmm. like oh hey everyone's got cancer so it must be like the 5g cell phones or some shit yeah right? but, but 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 i will say i have had like a cop stick a flashlight right in my face and that really did that really just did, did disorient the shit out of me all right yeah <laughs> or you have like a truck behind you like when you're driving at night and it's got those big ass halogen headlights on it and you look up at that rear view mirror and you swear to God, you just looked right into the Ark of the Covenant. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, because they said it appeared like it was fabric in the wind. So, I mean, we've all seen birds, those kind of birds, right? Like flock and move around in the sky. Like that does, I could see how that's a good explanation, but the red fiery flaming eye, like, I don't know what that could have been. Yeah. Yeah, the bird explanation completely ignores that. And it also ignores the whole part of the story where it's swooping down over the townspeople. I mean, at that point, they're seeing it's birds, right? I mean, it's right in your face. I mean, come on. So I just, oh, so I just had this random thought, like, what if, that I don't think anybody's ever put out there before, it just hit me. Uh-oh, exclusive. Okay, what if the red eye was the weird creature and the red eye like was making the birds following it or, or the birds were chasing it and that's why it looked like it was one thing but it was just the red eye and the birds all followed it i don't know hmm. that's a fascinating idea i have not thought of that before yeah that so it'd be like the what you're saying is so the the ball the flaming eye is actually a craft or a ufo or a uap or, what, or something and it's emitting light and the birds are chasing it or they're drawn to it and that and because of that it looks like one thing all right all right yeah, yeah okay okay you know this is the okay i like this this is different i like that all right all right lamay all right I'll, okay now i'll even take it to another direction so uh -oh. in new mexico where i'm from the witches in flight they don't ride brooms they either turn into owls or they turn into fireballs so i was like what if that was a witch and fireball form oh damn and like i don't know like and that you just blew my mind it could be i don't know because we all want to think of that as strictly a ufo type thing but maybe it was a witch yeah so yeah maybe it was like a witch in flight yeah oh that's pretty cool and what and now what if the birds following her aren't like aren't necessarily following her as if tracked in light but they're doing her bidding <laughs> oh i like it yeah that could be that that's a big witchcraft thing like because uh in new mexico at a pueblo called abiquiu they claim that uh, a flock of crows would follow the witches wherever they went. Oh, damn. I think we just cracked this thing wide open, guys. Yeah. Maybe we did. Case closed. And here, I, I was so worried I would have nothing to say because uh, I like forgot what we were going to talk about. And I asked Laura, like, were we talking about skinwalkers? What were we doing? And she was like, oh, the Crawfordsville monster. And I was like, oh. What's that? I, I, don't, I don't remember anything <laughs> about that other than it's a thing. It's just a thing. <laughs> Yeah, we don't talk about skinwalkers around here. Those guys, I owe a couple yeah. of them money. 
So I don't, yeah. I, I don't bring them up. Yeah, it's uh, best not to bring them up. Yeah. Like Candyman, you say their name too many times, goddamn things just pop up. Well, that's true. That's actually the real belief for anyone listening who's not from yeah. New Mexico, yeah, or Utah. You know, yeah, if you say their name out loud at night, they might appear. Or if you whistle at night, that's a big superstition for anything. If you whistle at night, you attract whatever boogeyman, the lechuza or the skinwalker or whatever. Yeah. Or the, or the Sasquatch. One to go too, right? Yeah, one to go too. Well, and being that these uh, these two uh, guys were out there working, they're the, these ice these uh, ice men were out there working. I guarantee you, the one guy was whistling. Hey, you know he's whistling. Yeah. He, I, I okay again. I think we cracked this open. Yeah. It's 1891. What else are you gonna do? Yeah, he yeah. was whistling while he worked. That's exactly why they made that phrase. Yeah, and uh, and I guarantee you, he brought that shit down on their head. <laughs> I think we cracked it open, guys. This this guy. This guy screwed up the whole damn thing for everybody. I think so. This is a good theory. Yeah. Case closed. Case closed. Shut her down. Well, it's been a great podcast. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All right. So I'm trying to think what else. I feel like we nailed it. Well, we could talk about, I know of, uh, I can't remember the details, but in terms of atmospheric beasts, there was another famous mm-hmm. case from the 1920s. Okay. When these weird uh, flying snail-like creatures landed on a mesa in nevada and i don't have the book in front of me but like I, all i remember is 1920s these strange atmospheric beasts that look like flying snails land on some mysterious plateau in nevada and these pilots like sight them did they salt the snail <laughs> i guess they could have <laughs> now now so these atmospheric beasts are these things that live in our atmosphere are they from like literally outer space just traveling the cosmos, and then they just kind of dip in? Or are they just stuck up there, like, in the clouds, hmm. just hanging out? I think both have been postulated as theories that they, they come from other planets, or they're just native to Earth, but we never see them. Like a time slip? Or what are we talking? Just different realm? Uh, just they're always up there, and they don't come down very often. Kind of like a nope, I guess. Okay. So many of these stories, are, they are similar, where it's just the sort of thing you don't see, or you only get a hint of it or whatever. It's always sort of obscured in some way. Mm. Um, and then, and, and in the rare occasion when you do actually get to see it, uh, it's always some undescribable goddamn thing. It's always like a jellyfish or it's like a, or in this case, like a, I, right. mean, I don't know, I, like a, yeah. like a, like a tarp caught in the wind or something. But, but then they describe this thing as also having fins, which is just bizarre. Like it's got fins, but it has no form. I like, I can't wrap my head around that. What about uh, that these people were just making it up? Does the reverend and the ice the ice men have anything to gain? Uh, so here's another cool thing about the reverend is in his later years, he actually helped solve a murder in Crawfordsville. I, some, I, one of the other pastor's wives got murdered or something, and somehow mm-hmm. he helped the police solve the case. So he sounds like he's a pretty stand-up dude, um, and pretty truthful. Well, unless he he himself was the murderer, and he framed and he and he framed the other guy. Oh well, there he go again. <laughs> Crack the case. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying he did, but I mean, that's what I would do anyway. <laughs> Sam, come on. I'm not going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we don't think it was made up. I don't think so. Well, it's so weird. I mean, if you're going to make something up, you make something up. People can wrap their heads around. Yeah, I mean, this is just so goddamn bizarre. I mean, it's like. It has no shape. It's got a one red eye. It's got no mouth, but it's making a wheezing sound. It's got flippers. Flippers. It's got flippers. It's got fits. Whatever. I, I mean, it makes no goddamn sense. I mean, if you're gonna make something up, you'd make up like a like a like a dragony looking thing or something. You know, I don't know. But they said it circled the whole town, right? I believe so. Yeah, that's all. I think so. Hmm. But it gives me hope, though, for the other weird articles because um. I mean, I've done like 20 books now based on these old articles from Pioneer period, uh, just whether they're airships, UFOs, Bigfoot, dinosaurs, monsters, vampires, whatever. There's tons of these articles. And uh, I'm really glad that the Crawfordsville case got investigated by Fort, you know, because obviously today we could not ask good old Reverend Switzer, did you see it or not? But Fort could. And so the fact that Fort really endorsed it, and Switzer was a real guy. We even have his picture in, in the book, and you know that he claimed this really happened. You know, it gives me hope that maybe at least some of the other stories happened, 
and they mm-hmm. weren't just yellow journalism for entertainment. And, and and that happened a lot back then, didn't it? I mean, just a lot of just cranking that shit out to, to sell papers. Yeah, and there was like this innocent time for for us as researchers probably in the 1990s where I don't think we realized that because like there was a case from Kalamazoo, Michigan about pink aliens that crashed in a UFO and were wearing like Greek togas and that was taken seriously for just a little while because it was a real newspaper article and I think people in the, the 90s didn't stop to think oh they were just making this stuff up now we realize a lot of those articles were pure entertainment and i'm of the belief that about half of them are made up by the reporters another percentage is maybe made up by the witnesses but it's still like a real story so to speak and then a a smaller percentage are actual real stories just like there is a story you know we all know lizard man from south carolina in like the Mm -hmm. 1980s well there was also lizard man in the south carolina in the 1890s you know strikingly similar appearance all that it's like what are the odds they were writing about this thing in the 1890s and they claim they see it again in the 1980s you know so some of them a very small amount of them i think are actually real Mm -hmm, that's interesting yeah so how do you uh as you're making your books and writing your books how do you distinguish one from another i mean how do you i mean is there any way to just be like well this is obviously crap you know or i mean can you is there any way to even tell them apart like a real story from a made-up story sometimes so occasionally uh you'll see when you actually look at the the newspaper itself literally you know like you can see what article is on either side of it when all of the articles are silly and stupid then you know oh this was just the joke page you can forget about this art uh, but i mean for, as for like legitimacy let's say you find an article from the 1890s that is describing a dinosaur and it has the dinosaur actually run with the stance that paleontologists think they ran with today which is like kind of head and neck in line with the tail because so there's a lot of articles about dinosaurs that seem really cool and encouraging from that time period but how you can tell those are probably hoaxed is the dinosaurs are portrayed as being like kangaroos because paleontologists in the early 1900s late 1800s they really thought that theropod dinosaurs like the t-rex would hop around like a kangaroo whereas today they totally don't think that so i mean so yeah if you see a dinosaur article where it's hopping around like a kangaroo obviously that's probably fake but if you see an article where it's it's you know running like they think a dinosaur would today that's a good indication that uh yeah it happened and what's even stranger is with the weirdest of these articles i can usually find the the witness and find out that they actually existed and were real and you just have to wonder well did they make up this story for fun i mean what was their deal well, you know, and, and to 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 just touch on that for a second about the dinosaurs thing, I do remember hearing a story not that long ago where it was it was a description of a dinosaur that see of a literal dinosaur that just sort of stepped out of the fog, and these people saw it, and it was in an old newspaper, and they described its tail as being like a whip that it was like moving around, and and the thing that caught me, like you said, was that as far as I knew, like back then they they always thought they just dragged their tails you know like everything like all the descriptions you saw like yeah. all the depictions you saw had a like a like a mm-hmm. uh a, a potosaurus or a brontosaurus or any of those sort of things that their tail is always dragging behind them and they're these slow things where this thing describes something running with its tail whip or not necessarily running but but moving faster with this tail whipping around so yeah th- that does uh it just it does cause me to think, I guess. Don't think too hard, Sam. Don't want to hurt yourself. I never do. I never do. <laughs> so are we saying that it's not a UFO at all? Yeah, totally. That's I'm hundred percent on the atmospheric beast train. And and when you say a, a UFO, you're you're talking like a like a like a vessel, like a like a flying saucer. A vessel. Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure because I mean technically, technically UFO, unidentified flying object. It is a UFO. Right. Right. I mean, not to get technical, but you're right. I got it. Always corrected me. It's very rare. So I jump on the chance when I get when I get to. <laughs> it makes me feel smart. All right. I'll give you that one. 
I mark that on my calendar. <laughs> what else, Sam? Well, so okay, so through all the through all the stories and all the books and all the stuff that you've done with this, have there? I mean, like, was was there a rash of these sort of sightings, or is this just a one off? I mean, has this ever happened before? Like before or since? Like this sort of weird description? Oh yeah, there's been nothing else that sounds like the Crawfordsville monster that comes to my memory, and there's probably somebody out there who's like oh well there's this one or that one that i just haven't seen and you haven't seen uh so i mean potentially maybe there's uh something similar but nothing comes to mind um and again you know i mean anybody anybody listening i would just google atmospheric beasts and they'll probably pull up a pretty good list of of similar creatures but i mean in terms of just strange articles like i said there's like hundreds of them just tons of whether it's dinosaurs, vampires, werewolves, whatever, you know, they definitely wrote about it all the way back then. And this was in Indiana too. Like I can't even, I can't think of anything else that really happened in Indiana. Uh, I I remember a lot of cryptids from Indiana. Actually, Indiana loved to tell big snake stories like about giant snakes or lake monsters. Uh, I seem to remember a story from Indiana where they killed something like a Komodo dragon. So yeah, yeah, tons of Indiana stories for sure. Okay. Um, well, I don't know about way back then during the 1890s or whatever, but I could tell you cryptids in the 1900s uh, in in Indiana. We had the Beast of Busco, you know, the giant turtle Oscar, you know. There was the Randolph County cistern monster, about some sort of octopus type creature living in a guy's cistern, you know. There was that one. Uh, there was the Mill Race monster, you know. And, of course, uh, oh, God, what's the last one? Oh, the Green Clawed Beast. The Green Clawed Beast, yes. Uh, out there in the Ohio River in Indiana. It's confusing, hmm. I know, but there you go. I'm going to have to like, Google that. I th- yeah, I mean, what I'd have to do is, like, word search some of my books. Like, just word search Indiana. Because, like, I know Indiana comes up a lot in those old articles. I, I think they love to write stuff like that. But I just can't remember the specific cases. So, John, would this have coincided around the same time as all the airship sightings? So there was, uh, you know, I mean, the big wave of airships was 1896 to 97, but there were airships prior to and after that, so uh, just not as much as in 96 and 97. Did any of those, are, are you aware of any of those going through Indiana? Or I know, I know Minnesota had them. Yeah, Indiana definitely, I for sure, I remember uh, that state having a pretty decent okay. amount of airship sightings. I'm not piecing anything together here. I'm just curious. I'm not, <laughs> no, don't worry. I'm not building it. I'm not building a big, big case or anything. All right. Yeah. <laughs> just curious where they think. Yeah. I'll, I typed in atmospheric beasts, Indiana, and all it's coming up is Crawfordsville monster. And then the beast of Busco, which me and Sam actually went and saw. Oh, that's cool. I would love to do that. Yeah, that was pretty sweet. It's just a big uh, cement uh, turtle stand in the middle of town. But you know what? There's something. Yeah, There's something still pretty awesome about yeah. just being like, oh, there it is. Well, I mean, you know, for people that don't know, I, I live in Roswell, so I grew up with these little cardboard alien cutouts just everywhere. And I think that's why I like Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster better is I got so tired of those aliens. I just wanted to see something else that was strange other than aliens. Oh, that totally makes sense. Have yeah. you lived there your whole life? Yeah, that's that's why, again, you know, the, them aliens ain't shit. <laughs> it's all about bigfoot bigfoot Loch Ness monster that that's the cool stuff sam he just said you're cool well i know that it's good for him he, yeah he, totally. he's got good taste we already said that earlier he's a smart guy what do you got coming up is the witch book out yet so yeah my that was why my mind went to fireballs on the crawfordsville monsters uh, i am i finished a book on the witches of new mexico i can't even remember what i called that book i think i'm calling it the New Mexico Book of Witches. Yeah, so you guys can search that. The New Mexico Book of Witches. It's a bigger, more scholarly book than what I typically do. Lots of end notes and like historical minutia. Just uh, again, basically every single witch story I could find from New Mexico, whether it was like Skinwalkers or Lechuzas, La, La Llorona, um, just all that's in there. It's a big book. And then also, I think by the time this airs, I'll have uh, the eighth book out in the Cowboys and Saurian series, which is called Settlers and Serpents. Ooh. And that one's all devoted to uh, the giant snake stories. Oh. Sam's excited. I do love those books, goddammit. They're so good. They're so good! I do, Sam. One day I do plan on doing a Bigfoot book. Uh, 
I just, uh, Chad Armand, I think already did it a long time ago. I think it's called the historical Bigfoot. Oh yeah. 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 Let me Google that and make sure. Cause sometimes I know this is bad. Sometimes I mix up Chad Armand and Chad Lewis. Cause they're both Chad's um, and I'm, I'll be like, Chad Lewis wrote, Oh no, I meant Chad Armand. Yeah. Uh, nope. You, actually, you were right the first time. It was Chad Armin. You you had it. Okay, good. All right, good. Okay. Yeah, but I I like both the Chad stuff. They do cool stuff. So. Yeah, I got that that historical Bigfoot. That 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 is a tome that that you could like you could put that in a you could put that in a pillowcase yeah. and beat someone to death with it. It's a big book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It well, and Chad did a similar book already to Settlers and Serpents, which is uh, Boss Snakes. So that one's really cool too. Oh. Yeah, so my big standout piece, I think, from the Settlers and Serpents book, there's a spot in New Mexico called Pecos Pueblo. Um, some of the coolest ruins here in the state, and allegedly it was home to a giant rattlesnake that the Pecos uh, tribe would sacrifice their members to. Like They would like feed this snake either uh, the elderly that were too old, or they would feed it babies. Mm. And that was like their their monster god, and it's a really wild story because it had like it was in a cave with the eternal flame of Montezuma, because for some reason they thought Emperor Montezuma from Mexico was born in northern New Mexico and Pecos, and it's a whole wild mythology up there. And I actually went to Pecos this last winter and, and got to see it in person, and it was it was pretty cool. How big of a snake are we talking? Just big enough to eat a person, I guess. However big that was, yeah. That's a damn big snake. That is a damn big snake. Because I'll tell you, anacondas, yeah. anacondas go get up to like what, like almost thirty feet, and they technically, technically, can't eat a full size person because they can't get past the shoulders. But yeah. if they're small enough, maybe. I don't yeah. know, a baby, they could definitely. Eat. I mean, I could polish off two babies myself, no problem. But the <laughs> yeah. snake, that's a whole different story. Okay, are you going to be uh, at any events? promoting your books or anything you know one thing i'd love to promote that i haven't really gotten off the ground yet you know everybody knows me for nonfiction. i did a novel about billy the kid it's it's an aging billy oh. the kid who faked his death returns to fort sumner new mexico to fight an evil skinwalker so if somebody wants to try out my fiction that's called once upon a time in fort sumner and don't you have a podcast? Thank you for, yeah, my co-host on my podcast would be so mad at me. So I have a friend in Roswell named William Atkinson. He came up with a really cool idea, which is we take three weird old stories, just like the Crawfordsville monster. We did an episode on that, but we take these old weird stories like that and we combine them with other weird old stories to make like a fictional book or movie pitch that we just brainstorm live on air. And uh, so it's called Plot Pit. Plot Pit. So, you know, with Plot Pit, you'll learn some facts and some cool stories, but then you'll also get to listen to me and William and whoever our guest is that week just make up some crazy movie pitch out of these strange stories. That that, that may be the coolest idea I've ever heard <laughs> yeah. for, for, for a podcast ever. My oh. God. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, maybe maybe Sam could be on it sometime. Maybe we could do a Ooh. Bigfoot episode. You know? Ooh. Oh yeah! Don't 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 threaten me with a good time. That sounds awesome. Yeah, you'll just, you just you, you'll have to watch your language. We keep plot pit pretty pretty palatable, but otherwise, <laughs> I think you're a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> ah, fuck. <laughs> don't worry, my my mom is somewhere right now, just cringing like ah, I can hear him. <laughs> she can feel it every time I swear. It's like. Just, is your mom is your mom Patty from the the sixty seven footage? Is that Patty? Is Patty your mom? Patterson Gimlin. My mom's name actually is is Patty. This is, this is actually true. And 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 I just want to say, I mean, not uh, at that time, you know, she was young, and some uh, some cowboys wanted to take some photos of her out in the woods, and you know, she needed to make a couple bucks. So whatever she did, what she had to do. God damn it. That's fine. I don't judge. I don't judge. <laughs> yeah, that's well. That's no man. I mean, you know. I mean, like she's she's uh, she's uh, an icon in the community. I know. I know. Yeah. And, and the, uh, uh, exactly. And, and and you know what? I just want to say that film of her. Uh, uh, granted, yes, she is in the nude, but but it is tasteful. So again, tastefully done. It, you know what? It was yeah. the time. It was different. 
you know, it was all flower children and, and good times. So it's okay. It's fine. Yeah, Woodstock. Yeah. I mean, my dad didn't understand. My dad was pissed, but <laughs> now, now I will say, I will say, it's okay to call her Patty. She's going to cringe. She's not going to like it. You can get away with Patty, but under no circumstances call her Patsy. Okay? I'll end up like my aunt. She ripped that bitch's arms clean off. Okay? <laughs> so, just be safe. Go with Pat. Also, do not look her in the eye. She's old school. She'll take it as a challenge. All right. <laughs> anyway, that said, yeah, I got to say, your your book series of Lost, like, um, uh, uh, like was it Kong? Is it Unmade? Yeah, Kong Unmade. Yeah, and like all, like all those books that you did on all the movies that didn't get made, I'm going to tell you right now, there are, there are some gems in there. There's some real dogs. But there are some gems in there where I'm like, God damn it, why didn't that get me? That is just amazing. Like, that would have been oh, so good. Oh, I did a Lost Dinosaur Movies book. It's called Lost Films of the Lost World. So it's all the best dinosaur movies that never got made. You you just rung a bell somebody else I want to promote, which is Stephen Bassett, who wrote for uh, Swamp Thing. Oh, yeah. So he he's a really nice, cool guy. I've actually talked to him before a couple of times. And he uh, has written a few books under the title of Cryptid Cinema, which is all about, you know, Bigfoot movies, Loch Ness Monster movies, and uh, I think he's already got one out, but he's going to do another one called, I think it's like Cryptid Cinema Boggy Creek Prime. Oh, yeah. You know what? Uh, we were at Monster Fest, and they it was there. They were they. I got I got an autographed copy. Yeah. Uh, but I, cool. I thought they told me it was only the first chapter. But yeah, that is that one. Yeah, it's just a first chapter preview, and he calls it a chap book, which is I'm like, man, you shouldn't give me any ideas because maybe I'll start doing that. I'll just do one chapter, try to sell it, you know, sell oh, yeah. it to people like Sam who'll just buy my stuff, and then I'll, I'll feel bad. But yeah, oh, you're damn right. I'll buy anything, man. I don't care. <laughs> I love that stuff. I can't get enough. Are you kidding? Very cool. Where can people find your stuff? Just type in my name on Amazon and a bunch of books will pop up. I, and I do have a website. It's uh, bicepbooks.com. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for being on. And um, we want you to come back and talk about some more stuff. I would love to. And yeah. I'm, I'm totally down. So it sounds good to me. Yeah, awesome. Just keep cr- cranking out the books. We'll, we'll bring you back. Sounds Bye, good. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, guys. I enjoyed it. All right. Bye. You know, you know what? That's uh, that John LeMay. He's a he's a pretty good guy. He's a pretty good guy. He's pretty swell. I like him. Yeah, you know what? And and I love when you meet these guys. Like I've been look, I've been reading the guy's books for years. To finally talk to the guy, I mean, not technically in person, but to actually talk to him, you know, it, it makes me feel better about giving him all that goddamn money because <laughs> it has been a shit ton of books. Yeah, I'm gonna. Have, I have a couple, so I'm gonna have to uh, buy some more for my collection and read them. Yeah, you're gonna. You got a lot of catching up to do. I do. A lot of catching up to do. So, yes. Tell me this. Now we're done talking to John. Okay. Mm-hmm. How do you feel now? Are you still Are you still thinking it's birds? Well, you kind of sold me with the hot air balloon being popped. I'm gonna tell you right now that was the liquor talking. I've sobered up since then. No one, no one in their right mind would believe that story. Okay. What are the chances that you think it is a flock of birds? <laughs> like killed deer? Yeah. No, absolutely not. I am telling you right now, 100 percent certainty. No reservations whatsoever. 100% atmospheric beast. That's what you think, really. Yes, it is a living creature that came down from space or the upper atmosphere. And it just floated down and, uh, I don't know, scared the shit out of a bunch of townspeople and went back up. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. God damn it. I don't know. I, I got to think about it. You know what? Forget it. Yeah, just why don't you do the outro? Let's get out of here. And we, we got a road trip to plan because we're going to Van Meter. Woohoo! Van Meter, Iowa. Yeah! Home of the Van Meter Visitor. We're going to make it fun. Goddamn right we are. It's going to be a blast. I cannot wait. Look, this is like the th- one, two, three. This is like the third year I've gone. All right. I'll tell you right now. It is so much fun. I love that damn thing. I love it too. You better not steal my beef jerky. I am going to buy you a whole new thing of beef jerky. I am sorry. I am going to eat half of it though. <laughs> what? Sam, do you know where people can find us? I do not, but I know someone who does, and her name is Laura Cram. Laura... Hey, that's me. Fire away. You can find us at creepyacres.com and you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Also YouTube. And we're on the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, which is now called X, Threads, and we have merch at tpublic.com. 
Am I missing anything? Look, I, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't really paying attention. I, look, Laura, let me just say this. All right. Uh-huh. This whole thing, the whole Crawfordsville monster thing, the whole thoughts of atmospheric beasts and all this, you know, life beyond our, our planet. It's really, it's just really screwing with my head. And I got, I got to tell you right now. I got to tell you right now. I want to share a quote that I think absolutely sums this whole thing up. And it's really going to explain a lot. What is it? And that quote is simply this. Quote, full of the juice that carries the spaceship as far as it wants to go. Because when the moon is blood red, the heavens have opened up from above. You've got the power to make the skies rumble and the earth shake in the sheets of the wind. Then I will survive. End quote. Those are some uh, pretty wise words. Pretty wise words. And I can tell because I have no clue what they say. And that's usually a sign they're pretty goddamn smart. And do you know who said those great words? No. It was none other than Crawfordville, Indiana's very own 1991 WWF Heavyweight Champion, the Ultimate Warrior. Yes, yes, yes. We have some parts unknown. On that note, bye.